Welcome to the Grand Hill Chronicles podcast. I'm your host, Don Bishop, uh, writing as T.S. Pedramon. And today is October 27th, 2023, as we record this. And that's correct. That is the same date that I recorded my last episode, our chat with Matthew Kent. Um, it's just, yeah, public. Um, sorry, I stutter sometimes. Pub- publishing them on, on different days. Today, we are welcoming author Devin Erickson to the podcast. Uh, uh, now, hi. Do I call hi. you Glad to Mr. Erickson? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, all of this is always recorded weeks in advance. You know, I'm at, we fix everything in post. I'm actually a talking kangaroo and he's not wearing any pants and we all just sort of put it together later. Th- these faces are just AI deep fakes. Yeah, yeah, it's it's all fake. Nothing you see on camera is real. But regardless, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, and glad to have you. Now, what can you tell us about yourself a little bit? Um, tell us about your background and uh, well, I don't know what, what you studied or, or your day job. How did I come to this? Well, yes. how I came to this is a short story, but a long journey. I'm actually the son of of one of the lead programmers on the Voyager spacecraft. So I spent a lot of my childhood hanging around JPL and, uh, you know, going to all of the Voyager press conferences where the, uh, the photographs of the outer planets were coming up live on the screen. And this was the what's first the, time anyone What's the JBL? It. Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Oh, JPL. Okay. Yes. 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 Sorry, my, I, I mutilate English on a regular basis. You know, I have no first language. English is my second language. My first language is just grunts. Um, <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> but, uh, so I, I got a very sort of close up view of what I thought would be the future. You know, I was imagining at eight years old, oh, we're going to go out there and At the same time, I was spending my weekends in the back of a library, uh, you know, with head high piles of science fiction classics, you know, Niven and Heinlein and that sort of thing. So when I was a teenager, I wanted to be a science fiction writer and a bunch of uh, older people said, oh, honey, that's not a very good dream. You should go do something practical. And, you know, I wanted money. So I tried a bunch of different careers and eventually wound up as an engineer for about 20 years. And then when I retired, I said, okay, well, now I don't have to worry about paying the bills. I can do what I want. I'm going to go back to the first thing I wanted to do when I was a child. And that is tell fantasy and science fiction stories. So yeah. here I am. Yeah. And that reminds me, and I, I think I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but uh, I heard a story of Jim Carrey, uh, yes. Jim Carrey's father, actually, oh. um, played the saxophone and apparently played it not too shabby, shabbily. Um, but, you know, that's, you, you don't want to go and, and live in the gutter. So he became an accountant uh-huh. and uh, worked for some accounting firm up in Canada. And um, then at, at one point he was, he was laid off or something like that. And, and it wasn't even his fault. You know, there was, there was some economic downturn and, or, or yeah. maybe his company yeah. was, he was, he was by another company. left with time on his hands. And so, so here he was, um, without a job, failing at providing for his family at, at something that he didn't really want to do. Yeah. And so the, the takeaway for, for Jim Carrey was, you know, why fail at something you don't even want to do at least yeah. try yeah. Yeah. to do what, what you you dream. Yeah. So. yeah. You know, sometimes we have to work a little bit to get there, but when you're doing creative work you're always swinging for the fences and if everyone played it safe we would have 
nothing to read, nothing to watch, nothing to listen to, nothing to fire our imaginations. And that's what I think is so important about science fiction, because if we look at pretty much every technological advance for the last hundred years, you can always go and you can find a science fiction writer who anticipated it beforehand. Now, mm. they don't always get 100% of the details right, uh -huh. but always invention is preceded by imagination. You know, now we're going back to the moon. We're thinking about colonizing Mars. We're trying to create artificial general intelligence. And none of this would have happened if we hadn't had this sort of societal conversation in the hypothetical about, wow, we could maybe do these things and they might work and here's what they might be like. And gosh, that's, that's kind of neat. I, I want. It. Yeah. Some, uh, some weeks ago I watched 2001, a space odyssey, which I had seen before, but I was, I was uh -huh. a kid when I did. And it's interesting to go back and, and watch it from this perspective, um, uh, and, and see what the, see what they got right or kind of right and see what they got wrong. And it's, yeah. it's interesting. Like we have yeah. video calling. Yeah. Um, we do have, um, more spacefaring than, than there was before, but yeah. not nearly as, as much as was imagined. And then we don't yeah. have like a stewardess in space with magnetized shoes, you yeah. know? Yeah. Uh, in yeah. fact, I, I'd say that that's yeah very different because society yeah. has changed. Yeah. I mean, yeah. apart goal, from that, I choose just wouldn't work yeah. like that. The goal is not to get it 100% right. Because if I could design a fusion engine and an artificial general intelligence that is, is copied from a human memory. And if I could design neural implants that gave everyone virtual and augmented reality displays in their own heads, just to name a few, uh, mm -hmm. technologies from my debut novel it's sitting on the shelf behind me there. Um, then I wouldn't be writing science fiction. If I could design all these things in an utterly realistic fashion, I would be, I would be starting several companies and actually making these things. So, you know, when you're one guy and your tool is your imagination and a keyboard, then you're not really supposed to get it 100% right. You're supposed no way you to can make it convincing. And you're supposed to make it compelling so that people's imaginations go there. And then, you know, maybe you inspire some engineers. I was an engineer for 20 years. So I was, I was definitely inspired by a lot of science fiction and the things that I tried to build, but that's sort of the, the social role of the science fiction writer is, mm -hmm. is to imagine the possible and not to finish conversations, but to start. Them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, let's, uh, let's give you a plug for, for your book. You said okay. it's, it's not yet launched. It is launching on November 11th, November 11th on Amazon and Ingram spark. So it may eventually be in bookstores. Um, it is available for pre-orders right now for eBooks and starting November 11th, you can get print copies like this lovely hardback right here or the paperback behind me. If you prefer that, some people like dead trees, some people like eBooks. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. And this is, this is timely cause I'll publish this maybe next Thursday, the second, or maybe. Oh, Good. Yeah. Maybe the following yes. Thursday, the ninth. Yes. And it is this, this is a love letter to every stack of science fiction classics I ever hid in the back of the library, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with, um, it's, you know, it's got some modern touches thrown in there as well, 
little, little bit like the expanse, a little bit like the Martian. If you enjoyed those titles and you, you want some of the, maybe like the old science fiction classics, like ring world a little bit with some character depth thrown in there. Yeah. You know. uh-huh. So I had a lot of fun. I really, yeah. Did. And so theft of fire, what, um, theft of fire, theft of fire. Is this, um, and it also says orbital space. Is this part of a series? This is the first of a series. Series called working, Orbital Space? Yes. Yes. Okay. I am working on the second one, Box of Trouble, right now. Okay. I will, yeah, we will definitely talk again. And, and we, we mentioned this briefly before we kicked off the episode, um, that I'm also a uh, pre-debut novel, although I'm not as close as, as you are. I, I just finished my manuscript last week. So I will be, I will watch with interest uh, how, how this release goes for you. Yes, well, we will definitely have to to talk and try to pass on some of the things that we have learned in this process, because getting from I have a completed manuscript to here is my Amazon page upon which you may order it is a is a long journey with a lot of hurdles. Mm-hmm. And the the traditional publishing industry is no longer what it was so often. You have to figure out these steps for yourself, but that's both bad and good. It's, it's bad because it's a little more work, but it's good because it gives you a lot more creative control and allows you to keep a lot more of your hard earned money so that you can afford to put out the next one. Yeah. Also, it puts you in this wonderful position where you're only responsible to the, you mm-hmm. don't, you don't have to please publishing houses, agents, these kind of things where they all have, you know, nowadays, a lot of them have very strong opinions on what people should read rather than on what people want. To read. And, yeah. You know, being independent allows you to focus on giving readers something to love and not really caring about industry pundit opinions so much and just just developing that direct connection with the audience you're hoping to build yeah and i um so i'm i'm standing at um a precipice you could say i am on an internship during my last few months on active duty in the marines Ah. and this internship yeah i'm i'm interning with full magazine publishing they're a small independent mm-hmm. publisher they they focus on uh graphic novels but they've uh-huh. allowed me time to work on my manuscript so i could i could get my book written and and uh pursue everything within the nexus of of the business including podcasting like i'm doing right now yeah that's so great come uh come december 1st i'm going to be without income and uh, you know, I have, I have some savings and I'm, I'm awesome. trying Burn to build ships. up, build up a new career. Burn the ships. So what I was saying, Burn the uh, ships, no retreats. I was talking to somebody about this yesterday, how like at work, I am responsible to somebody else and he gives me a task and I am to see that task completed to his specification, Yes. which he may or may not clearly communicate to me. Yes. And so while I'm doing the task, I'm constantly guessing in my mind, mm-hmm. trying to trying to guess what he's going to want, what his yeah. vision is, yeah. without there being time to find yeah. out, like, do you mean this? Do you mean that? There's just not yeah. time. Yeah. And worrying that I'm going to come back having done it not to his liking and be judged for that. Yeah. Now, with, on the um, contrast that with working on a computer or a car, and it works or it doesn't. There's no opinion. There's no judging. And if it doesn't work, it's because you missed some detail. And nobody's upset about that. It's just it works well, or it doesn't. quite frequently they are because they, they spend a great deal of money to make sure this engineering project works. And quite frequently there is some ambiguity there because the definition of work mm-hmm. is to perform the desired task, which means that somebody somewhere in English has to be describing 
what the system you're building is supposed to do. Yeah, but if if I'm trying to moment the moment my my son is here. Okay, we speak Spanish. Um, if if I'm working for myself to get the car to to operate the way I want it to. Yes, I decide if it's good enough for yes. me. Oh yeah. Now yes, publishing books is kind of a mix because yeah, I need to publish a story that works for a lot of people. Oh, uh-huh. but I can view that that broad readership as a matter of fact thing and it's not up to your opinion or your opinion like if i have a hundred people that loved the story i don't care if i if i have 30 people that don't find their audience yeah you're you're trying to write for thousands and thousands of people but you don't necessarily know which those thousands and thousands of people are so often you're writing for yourself and feeling like okay Maybe there's enough people out there who enjoy the things that I do, Mm -hmm. but there's still some ways in which you're beholden to the reader. And one of those is that regardless of who they are and how that audience works, you have to treat them with respect, which is one of my sort of hesitations about the traditional publishing industry in this part of the 21st century is that you know a lot of people working at these sort of big five publishing houses have very strong opinions about what people should read Mm -hmm. what they should be exposed to and they're more sort of predisposed to to talk and to articulate what they think people should should hear and should read and they're not quite as disposed to listen they see readers as the sort of passive receptacle of whatever message they want to put into a story and i don't think you can write very well if you see readers that way i think you have to view them as intelligent people who have tastes Uh and you want to give them something to love. Yeah. Excuse me. I'm going to blow up a punching balloon for my son while we, while we talk, Uh but is that why you went, why you decided to publish independently rather? Well, did you look for a publisher or you just, I think think it sort of went in reverse, um, in, in reverse of that statement (laughs) where I wrote what I wanted to write, what I felt was a good story in isolation Uh without really looking at what was fashionable in the publishing industry or, or what's hot these days, because the publishing industry tends to always chase the last thing, you know, they told Brandon Sanderson to, can you make it darker? Because he was trying to break in when George Martin was selling very well. Uh huh. And, you know, goodness knows what they would have told, told, you know, imagine that it's 1932 and you're trying to pitch Lord of the Rings in terms of the literature that existed in 1932. Hmm. Yeah. How do you, how do you even phrase that? So readership often craves the new, but that which is new is, is by definition difficult to describe. So I wrote something the way the story needed to be written, the way the story cried out to be written. And I found out, okay, you know, the traditional publishing industry is now very focused on message fiction and some of the alternative industry is is playing it a little safe and you know there's a lot of this sort of third person military science fiction with space marines shooting aliens and this kind of thing which can be an awful lot of fun but it wasn't what i was doing Mm -hmm. and so i had some very cordial conversations with a lot of people and the general idea was this is this is this is not something we're used to this is a little risky for us 
And at the same time, I was feeling like I had seized some of my independence by going, I'm not going to work for someone. I'm going to write it. I'm going to write books. And I'm like, I want to seize more of that independence by publishing this myself and having full control of the process so that I'm going to be beholden to no one but my readers. Mm -hmm. And that really, when I figured that out, I really, you know, I really just came alive with enthusiasm because it's like, I have an audience and the only thing that matters is making them smile and applaud. I don't need to ask anyone's permission to be, to create. I don't have to wait for someone to say, you can create, do so. I'm going to say, I can create, and I will do so whether you wish it or not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the only people who matter are the people who are picking up the story, you know, and yeah. if they're not putting it down and if they're happy at the end and they want another one, then that's success. I don't need or want a Hugo award or a Nebula award or anything like that. I want people to say, wow, I enjoy it. That's, that's my award. That's the award. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the, um, the, the challenge that that could face is yeah. people not being used to it and they don't know what kind of thing this, wow. this new thing is. And, oh yeah. Yeah. And that know. goes into how you, how you present the book, how you frame the book, how you describe the book, because your goal, for example, when you have cover art, and this is some of the work of, uh, French woman named Thea Magrand, who is, who is just brilliant. Um, part of the role of things like cover art and your back cover text and, you know, how you describe it, how you publicize it is not so much to make people say, oh, I want to buy this book because that's their decision. That's not your decision. You have no control over that. Mm -hmm. What the goal is is to describe the experience that they are going to have so that they can decide for themselves, oh, the way this Devin Erickson guy writes sounds like something that I would enjoy because it's got these things that I'm into. Or, no, I'm not into that. I prefer Agatha Christie locked room mysteries. You know, you don't want to trick people who aren't your audience into picking mm -hmm. up your book. Yeah. Because they're going to write one star reviews and they're not going to enjoy that. You've wasted their time. You've defrauded them. So, you know, I'm looking for the people who are into this kind of. Yeah. I saw, I saw, um, I saw something recently said there are two kinds of negative reviews and one is, is your, from your true audience, uh, giving feedback like yeah. that. Yeah. I wish I could remember yeah. that more. No, but this it, was very it, similar it's like, to something. Sorry. It was good, it was but similar. you know, this aspect of the story just, I felt let mm -hmm. down by this or whatever. And that's like, yeah. that's like yeah. actual feedback yeah. to your no. book. I the other negative review. Saying. I get what is, you're saying. You know, what I they, say they, often. They shouldn't have been your customer in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What I say very often is I, is I put it like this. There's two kinds of bad reviews. There's you overcook the fit. And there's I hate fit. And uh -huh. the first one is a failure of your writing. The second one is a failure of your marketing. Because you didn't make people understand that if they hate fish, they shouldn't order this because it's salmon. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, you, you know, the both are useful feedback, but you have to understand which one you're getting. Are you getting it on your, your targeting or are you getting it on your writing? 
And, you know, there's always going to be some people who pick things up for inexplicable reasons. And then they'll say, oh, you know, your protagonist swears like a sailor. Possibly that's because he is a sailor of sorts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, they're in tense situations and they don't always say, oh, gosh, darn it all to heck. <laughs> but you know you you try to make clear what it is that you're doing so that's that's all part of the process because a book is never really alive until uh you know somebody reads it and experiences it that's the whole intention yeah so well, you i'm sorry you uh you uh prefaced this interview in the emails we were sending back and forth with a very interesting question mm -hmm. and that was something about the uh the difference between fantasy and science fiction yeah and that uh for our listeners that was the i was i was about to when i said so just now i was i was uh -huh. gonna bring okay. that up uh -huh. um because this is a really interesting conversation. Uh, and I was actually, I was in, in my head, I was wondering if we should just continue and let the conversation flow naturally. Or... No, no, I was very eager the, to talk about that. The, um, well, I mean, we could make that its own episode. We yeah. could, but no, let's, let's jump into it. So the, the nominal um, topic of the interview that be before we jumped into it was going to be um, the difference between science fiction and fantasy. And I, I think we probably see it kind of the same way. Uh, possibly, but... possibly. Great minds think alike. <laughs> Rich minds sure. think independently, and that yes. often coincides. Yes, yes, yes. Well, there's a reason why people often compare and contrast fantasy and science fiction. You know you'll see bookshelves in bookstores labeled fantasy and science fiction. Mm -hmm. You don't, you don't see like fantasy and Agatha Christie, you know, nobody's shelving Tolkien next to Danielle Steele. So uh -huh. clearly fantasy and science fiction have something in common. And I'm going to lead this off with a bit of a controversial statement. And then I'm going to back it up a little bit so it makes sense. Okay. Science fiction is fantasy. I mean, where's the lie? It is. Well, here's how, here's how I define fantasy. Fantasy is any story that takes place in a hypothetical setting, which is different enough from the reader's daily experience that the author has to explain it to them. So you've got this hypothetical counterfactual world that you're putting your story in. And whether it's fantasy or science fiction really kind of just depends on where are you getting the, the sort of the thematic underpinning for your hypothetical universe. But that's the reason that these get shelved together and why their fandoms overlap to the point where the Venn diagram is almost a circle. Uh -huh. It's because there's a particular kind of reader. And, you know, personally, I think this is because they have active imaginations and they're very smart and, you know, they're, they're just... They're just better readers, in my totally unbiased opinion, <laughs> um, where, where they like to imagine these alternative universes and to do that rewarding mental work of figuring out as they go. So, yes, I would... I'm writing science fiction, but I consider that to be a subset of fantasy. Yeah, and I would say the... Um... I, I would use your definition of fantasy or um, I would, I mean, in my words, to put it in my words, fantasy is um, a, a setting or, or a story with, with major elements or any elements, honestly, 
that differ from our reality. And science fiction falls under that umbrella. Like think about um, Doctor Who, the TARDIS. Yes. This time traveling spaceship. Like how does it time travel? Uh, we have no... Who cares? We can't time travel. It just... Yes. And Wavium. Yes. It works. It time travels. Yes. And so the... Um, the it, it's, it's magic. It's a magic yeah. Yeah. element added to the yeah. story so that we can yeah. explore And that's, a, this that's universe. a lovely writer's trick there that they used because it allowed them to create a series with consistent characters but an ever-changing setting. Uh, yeah. Because you could go anywhere and you could experience anything. And if you want to create an episodic TV show, which still has an element of growth, which still has character arcs, you can do this. And whatever you want to do with your character arcs, you can pick out a setting for the next three episodes or whatever that's going to play to that. Mm -hmm. So... The Doctor Who was a was a very cleverly designed show. And, you know, if you watch some of the older ones now, they're maybe a little bit dated because they didn't have much of a budget. Yeah. <laughs> the Daleks are pretty silly. But it, they had a terrific amount of just imagination and writing skill to come up with some of the stuff. So I would say to try to define science fiction it's fantasy where the fantastical elements are largely uh, technologically explained yeah, or, yeah. or explained in the context of technology yeah personally i think that uh, i or think science, it should have been I called guess. engineering fiction rather than yeah. science fiction because well maybe not Maybe I'm a little bit tired of engineers doing all the work and scientists getting all the credit. Now, what about, um, what about this? I saw this movie on Netflix and um, there, there. I also recently saw uh, Kong versus Godzilla. Or is it Godzilla versus Kong? Uh -huh. uh, and it's one of those things where you, you have to turn off large parts of your brain and, and then you can well enjoy. you have to accept the basic premise of the story and th there's some litmus tests for quality here so that that's not the movie that i wanted to to mention uh -huh. okay uh it was um a romance a romance is it called upside down i think upside down i'm not sure i'm familiar 2012 yeah it's upside down Okay. So it's, uh, it's, uh, well, IMDB calls it a fantasy romance. Okay. But the, um, the fantastical element is gravity. And so it, oh. it feels more like a. Oh, yes. I've it's seen a science sort of fantasy market fantasy romance. Yes. It's, it's, it's two sort world. Of a Japanese animation. Yes. No, no. It, oh, so it, it stars else. Kirsten Dunst. Okay. Um, and I don't remember his name. Uh huh. But um, the, there are two worlds. They they rotate the same star, or whatever. But they're they're sitting in space right next to each other. Okay. Um, but they have like two flavors of gravity, and mm. one world has its own gravity yes. the other world has its own gravity yeah. and neither one affects yes. the other the, at all the physical consequences of this would be <laughs> like far reaching it's it's crazy to to think uh -huh. about and try to start uh -huh. constructing what that uh -huh. the, what all those implications are um but then you have to realize that they breeze over some things yeah uh, yeah same well, as godzilla like versus i said Kong. I'm not actually inventing fusion drives or general artificial intelligence. So I'm breezing over a few things too. There's, there's really kind of two elements to this. First of all, how easy is it to accept your premises? And that, that is, you know, partly not having ridiculous premises, but also 
how you present. And then the second one, which is vastly more important, because this is where a lot of stories that fail, really fail and fail hard, is once you've accepted this story's list of gimmies, like, okay, we have working fusion technology, or, you know, oh, you know, you have sprites from another universe that turn into swords or whatever it is that you have going on or two flavors of gravity once once the reader or the viewer has accepted those things does the rest of the story follow from those things in a logical manner mm -hmm. you know and oftentimes you will get people who who are writers or directors or producers who don't really understand this uh -huh. and you know they will they will react to criticism oh you know that that season of this show didn't work for me and they'll say well you're just it has dragons in it well okay i was i was unaware that i could just abandon all the rules of plot logic by putting a dragon in. I mean, you know, if that's a cheat code, I'm going to put dragons in every book. You know, mm -hmm. Nobody could criticize my massive plot holes. For it's uh -huh. like, it's, it's the, the, the element of fantasy is that you have dragons. But once you accept that you have dragons and you've been told some things about how dragons work and what they do, you have to be consistent. And you have to have people react realistically to that. And you have to have things that would happen if you have dragons happen. Yeah. Um, and I think it's interesting how, how sometimes... It's like viewing science fiction as a subset of fantasy. Yeah. You might you might wonder, well, what about hard science fiction? Oh, well, sure, sure. What well, is I write hard, hard science, science fiction. fiction? You know, I have spreadsheets. You know, I got help from a mathematician to, you know, <laughs> to figure all this out. You know, I had to do relativistic calculations. I had to you know, do rough designs for spacecraft weapons that would actually work. You so know. you, so have you been yeah. writing this book for, for a long time? Yeah. Yeah. It, it took me about nine months to produce my first manuscript, but, uh, you know, so the harder you derive, the, the more you derive it from projecting current engineering trends, the more you are hard science fiction. But again, even in hard science fiction, there are some gimmies because you can't actually design the technology. It's just about making it believable. And when you make it believable and when you treat the reader's intelligence with respect, then of course you can get away with a few things. I mean, the basic premise of one of the greatest modern hard science fiction stories Andy Weir's The Mark, which mm -hmm. if you haven't read the book, read the book. It's wonderful. I haven't seen the um, movie either. Well, see the movie. It is wonderful. And then read the book. It is wonderful too. Um, but, you know, the, the premise involves an accident caused by a Martian dust storm. And the atmosphere of Mars is actually about 1% the density of ours. So, you know, mm -hmm. 70 or, you know, 90 or 120 mile an hour winds on Mars would just be a gentle show. Uh -huh. you know, they wouldn't really do anything to you. So, but, you know, the rest of the book is just so wonderful in all of its science that we're like, okay, we don't care. We'll give you that. We'll give you that one. Because every author... You, you know, there's always, okay, you got to give me this so I can tell the story, but I'm not going to ask for too much and I'm going to ask for it in a manner where it, it makes sense and it flows. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's maybe the, 
maybe the distinction between hard and soft science fiction is just how much you're asking for uh -huh. and how you ask for it. Because it's all of this is a little bit vague. Genre is not a thing for writers. Genre is for readers. Genre exists to describe what the story is like so people know how to pick up what they want. You know, when you're writing, you don't think, oh, you know, this is going to be a, you know, a hard science fiction novel or a soft space opera science fiction novel with fantasy elements like laser swords and telekinetic powers, or this is going to be a werewolf romance. You don't, you don't categorize yourself like that. You just write a story and yeah. then, you know, when it hits the bookstore, somebody's got to shelve it somewhere and that's yeah. what genre is for. Yeah. Um, I was going to say. That, um, yeah, I mean, it's a question of, of how far you want to speculate. And there's, yeah. there's that umbrella term of speculative fiction uh, that people use yeah. to describe both yeah. fantasy and science fiction. Yeah. Um, and it's like, do we want to speculate? Okay, let's say we have dragons in this world. Or yeah. do we just want to say that let's pretend that we, that AI gets to the point and robotics get to the point gets to the point where we have believable androids. Yeah, yeah. Which you know hypothetically could totally happen. Yeah. Um, we're just not there yet. Yeah. So. Yeah. You, Actually, you know, I, I have a, uh, I have a, a short story uh, involving not 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 believable human looking, but but in self aware robots. You know, uh, but it's set in in like ten years from now, um, maybe fifteen years from now, and the the only deviation from our world, um, as far as what's realistic, is that we achieved these um, self aware robots, and then they overthrew us. You know, but that's. Yes, yes. Artificial intelligence plots tend to follow one of two patterns. Yeah, these are these are very popular tropes, and they're popular tropes because people like them. And mm -hmm. they're either the Terminator, and they want to wipe out their creators, or they're Pinocchio, and they want to be a real boy. Yeah. Or the... Well, um... Yeah, those are the two. Or the Matrix, and they want yeah. to enslave their creators. Uh, variation on kind of variation of the first variation on the Terminator. And one of the things I set out to do when I created an AI character was that I didn't want to do either one. I mean, I don't. I don't think these two plots are played out. You know, I don't think they'll ever be played out. There's always new variations. As Brandon Sanderson said, nothing done well is a cliche. But I wanted to try something different. So I created an AI character who, you know, her, her conflict is a little different. She doesn't want to be a human being and she doesn't want to destroy them. She's just trying to figure out her place in the universe. You know, what am I? What am I supposed to do? You know, what is it like being this, this unique and novel thing? <laughs> you know, you can, you can count the number of them in existence on the fingers of one hand. Mm -hmm. So, and I felt there was a lot of unexplored territory in there in the sense of you know, when we create characters, it's like, okay, what is it like to be this person? Well, what is it like to be this person who's not a human being, but is made by human beings to act like, you know, we spend, you know, decades of all sorts of abstruse philosophy, wondering if they're 
is or isn't a creator God and what we should or shouldn't do about that. And the, the position that the AI is in is a very different one because, you know, she's standing right there. <laughs> yeah. Like you can have a conversation with her. Yes, well, she's and it's not always a very nice person. It, and I would say it's not, not just the, um, the very obvious presence of the, the creator human, yes. but the, the fact that the, the AI character is living in the creator's world. Yes. Um, whereas yeah. the, the, the prevalent thought in society today is that if there is a God, he's up in heaven and mm -hmm. doesn't like we're living on this earth, not in yes. his heaven. Yes. 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 The creator's environment is designed around the creator, not the created in particular. And that's, that leads to all sorts of very interesting existential questions for an AI character, especially one as, as I wrote her, where you, you sort of get artificial general intelligence by kind of, you know, cribbing off evolution's notes and copying mm -hmm. human memories. So mm -hmm. you've got an artificial intelligence that never actually was a human, but it remembers being. Hmm. So there's a conflict between your memories and what you know to be true. Yeah. Yeah. That's intriguing. Yeah. I just, I threw in a lot of just little sort of what ifs. So, and, um, you know, you just kind of shake them in a bag and eventually a story comes out. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like we're probably winding down, but I do want to ask if you can give us a, a, a quick, um, what's the word? Not summary, but. Um, starts with an S synopsis, synopsis. Can, can you give us a synopsis of theft of fire? Ah, well, the whole orbital space series, uh, starts very small and gets very large. It starts with a petty criminal being blackmailed and it ends up in the technological singularity and the fate of the galaxy. <laughs> so it starts out with this, this guy, he's kind of broke. He's turned to petty crime to make the payments on his spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And somebody comes along and turns his life upside down. He blackmails him. She's, she's got plans for what she needs him to help her do. And he doesn't want to. <laughs> he's got plans of his own. And as it turns out, they, they both end up finding out the plan is a list of things that don't happen. A so, list of things that what? That a don't list happen. of things oh. that don't happen. <laughs> you know, no plan yeah. survives contact with the enemy. So it's, it's, and it starts out as this little adventure story set in this future society that's colonized the solar system. You know, it, a lot of beta readers said it reminded them, them, them of The Expanse or The Martian. And then the stakes kind of escalate from there because what, what this mysterious blackmailer is trying to do actually ends up being pretty important. So he has to figure out how he feels about it. It's very driven by a lot of the conflicts, how these characters eventually resolve their differences. Okay. Well, it, yeah, it sounds really interesting. And, um, I guess for, for my sense, can you tell me the word count? Just like a sense of how long it is. Well, or page count for our listeners. 150,000 words, which okay. in hardback ends up being, uh, somewhere around three, four hundred. 450 pages yeah. or so. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So it's a, it's, it's a pretty long read, which 
from the perspective of some people is a good thing. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm not targeting people who, who don't like to read. Well, and in the days of, yeah. uh, in the days of yeah. audible, people yeah. look for long books specifically. Oh, yeah. And that's yeah. how I first got into Sanderson. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I had a, a yeah. long commute, so I had audible yeah. and I didn't want yeah. to run out of yeah. a 10 hour book and then have another month before I could mm -hmm. listen to audible again. So I, yeah. I'm no, not quite no. up to writing Sanderson length stuff yet, but, uh, I, I don't cut things to the bone. I cut them uh -huh. as much as they need to be cut and no more. It should yeah. be taught. It shouldn't be threadbare. Uh, they say that, um, you know, there's, there's advice and I would say it's not bad advice that, um, if something isn't serving to push your 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 plot forward mm -hmm. then you should cut it but then you have to ask what does that mean like you're not going to have all action in all, every scene yeah. throughout the entire book yeah. you have to have character development yeah. Yeah. you have well, to show would... what kind of person this character is and and he's got to go and do something that has nothing to do with the plot but you need to get to know him so you understand I his would, actions in the I plot. would replace push the plot with spark joy if it does not spark joy in the reader throw it away you know it's it's that simple you know it, it's every every word is there so that someone can enjoy reading it so you know when you write your first manuscript you know you end up using a little bit of verbiage and you come up with some ideas that maybe you know you thought they were going somewhere at the time and and they didn't quite work with the rest of the stuff so you you cut that out but when you're wielding that knife you always have this idea that i'm going to cut something out when it doesn't help the story be a better story that they that people can enjoy Mm -hmm. If it's enjoyable, then leave it in. It's you know, like it, Tom it's Bombadil. there for the readers to like. Tom Bombadil was cut from the movies, mm -hmm. from Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. trilogy. Mm -hmm. And the story was there and it worked just yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's been a long time since I read The Fellowship mm -hmm. of the Ring. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't remember a lot. Yeah, I was Tom Bombadil, but going off of what other people say, it's a good addition to the story. It's it it belongs in that world, and it's part of the Hobbits' experience on their way to Rivendell. Well, it's it's all about whether the readers enjoy it or not. Yeah, you know, it's and I don't necessarily think the Tolkien has the uh, has the deciding opinion. You know, ultimately stories are bar by writers but they're for readers mm -hmm. and you know maybe tolkien who lived in a very different era and was a very different sort of person than a lot of his readers you know maybe he had some ideas about his mythology that he wanted to throw in there where the readers were more interested in a more tightly focused story so you know, personally, if I have been, if I had been his developmental editor, I would have advised him to cut it, but there are some people who love it. So, uh -huh. you know, maybe, maybe that's wrong. I don't know. We all I, enjoy different things about a story. I like that you point out that, um, it's not really even the authors yeah. say whether yeah. it, it necessarily yeah. has value there or yeah. not i mean yeah. it's, it's his say yeah. it was his say oh, whether yeah. it was there or not yeah but oh yeah yeah coming from yeah. a a musician's yeah. standpoint yeah. when i was in college and you know going to my one of my first music education classes and they're like what is music and i'm like well everyone knows what music is right but you think about it it's and as you think about right. it and and try to form yeah. a definition yeah. and that that matches everything that you yourself consider to yeah. be music and yeah. you you can you really try to be frank and honest with your definition that 
you find the definition expanding. Yeah. And it, it yeah. comes down to um, sound, which occurs in time, often utilizing pitch and timbre as, uh, as aspects conveys yeah, you know you can meaning. fiddle around with these definitions but all then you like it's is bird song yeah. music is the sound of a, a babbling brook music yeah well you know yes, that, if that's it means like something asking to you. whether submarines can swim yeah so like is it birds <laughs> calling music <laughs> to the bird who is words. singing maybe not maybe chew. the birds just saying hey i'm hungry you want to go get some seeds over there maybe it's not music to them but mm -hmm. i listen to it yeah, it makes me feel happy. It's music yeah. to me. Yeah, you're gonna you're going to treat it like that, and you know, ultimately, these these stories, the goal is how the reader is going to treat them and enjoy them. As an author, you are the god of your universe. You can do anything you want, but the readers are guests in your universe, and you're not the god of them. Mm -hmm. You can't force them to enjoy something. You have to have an idea of what they already enjoy and, and cater to that. Yeah. So, you know, the question of, of something like Bombadil, where some people say, oh, you know, you should have left that in because the author put it in, or no, you should cut it because, you know, people don't really enjoy it and it disrupts the flow of the story. You know, both of those are valid opinions. But ultimately, the criteria that we judge stories by is is whether or not we had a good time reading. Yeah. And if you don't have a good time reading it, then what's the point? Yeah. All right. Well, um, I think we'll we'll cut it off for there for today. Um, if you could stick around for a minute after certainly we close out. Uh, now I would like to, oh, where can listeners find you on the web? I, I mentioned that early on. Where can they find you? Ah, uh, I have a website, devonerickson.com. That's D-E-V-O-N-E-R-I-K-S-E-N. And that includes a preview of the first three chapters of Theft of Fire, links to social media and various pieces of short writing, um, Amazon page where they can pre-order the book if so inclined. And actually when this goes out, it should be live for actual orders like dead trees. Um, so yeah, the, the website is definitely the hub to find all the other different places that I can be read on the web. Okay. And looking at your website, uh, it looks like you will be at Chattercon in yes. January. Yes. And yes. confinement Lebanon. Uh -huh. I, I yes, I think so. Liber uh, yes, I, I, I make a number con of con appearances. Yeah. And I'm afraid I can't keep those all straight in my so, head. So, so for the if listeners. The, if it's on the schedule, I'll be yep, there. Yep, it's, uh, it's on your page under events. Yep. yep. So, and yeah, these are not terribly far because uh, you're, you're in Georgia or Alabama? I am in Tennessee. Tennessee, I, okay. I, I sort of, I sort uh, of. I think, I think this morning's south. guest was in was in Georgia. So Tennessee, yes. I'm in Virginia. So, oh. um, I don't know, maybe I'll see you at uh, Chattacon in January. Well, I certainly um, hope so. Are you going to 20 books? I'm sorry. All right. Uh, are you going to 20 books, Vegas? I, not, not familiar I with actually don't know. I have to confess that I'm okay. not 100% in charge of my own schedule. Okay. Um, if you're not aware, so it's but it's I a writers' will. conference. Uh -huh. It's not it's not a comic con. It's not really Ooh. for the the readers. There is a okay a well, signing will, event on the last. I will have time. my staff check it out. It's very soon. <laughs> that sounds it's very coming fun. up. It's the week after next. So, <laughs> um, yeah, there's a there's a Facebook group called Twenty Books to Fifty K, um, uh -huh. and that's the name comes from the notion that you're probably not going to make a living off of one published book. You know. Uh, one of the founders had looked at his his Kindle royalties one day, and it was seven dollars. Uh -huh. He's like, "Well, he did yeah. some math. He's like, if I had twenty of these, I'd be making fifty thousand a year." So, um, but that conference, they they have a conference every year. Actually, this year is the last 
20 books conference. Uh, they are handing the reins over uh, just because they have some people retiring from the from managing the conference. Mm -hmm. uh, so there will be a new conference built uh, similar, very similar, and, and not like all the vendors are being handed over um, for next year. But yeah, 20 books to 50K is uh, the Facebook group where you could look into it if well, you want. I will, and I will have my, my people have a look at it. If, conference if is in already. Vegas, November 6th through 10th. Ah, yes. So, anyway, so maybe I won't see you there, but maybe I'll see you at the Chattacon. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, or if you go to Liberty Con, that's another good one. It's Liberty Con. Tennessee, yeah. that's right. Yes, and, and tickets sell out very rapidly, so if you want to go. Utah in June? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so for our listeners, and now, like I promise, we, we really are closing out. Um, don't forget our Fan Tasty contest. Uh, so, you know, that came from a slip of the tongue and we ran with it. Uh, Fan Tasty. So take a picture of food that you cooked in your kitchen or that you grew in your garden and send it to uh, send it to us via email or via social media. Um, you can send it to fantasty at thorn.link or you can find me on social media at Grand Hill Cron on, uh, on uh, Instagram or you can tweet it at me. Um, my name is T.S. Pedramon or Don Bishop writes as T.S. Pedramon on Twitter. And there will be a $35 gift certificate to the restaurant or or retailer of your choice that we will award in December. We'll close the contest on at the end of November. Uh, so yeah, enter our fantasy contest and we will see you next time on the Grand Hill Chronicles podcast.